the second round of the Colombo's bloody internal conflict would take place soon after Joe the Blonde Gallo was paroled from jail. Gallo was now even more frustrated by his lack of position, both in financial status and underworld status within the Borgata, and all those years in stir only added to his frustration and resolve to get what he felt was due him and his. When he was released from his extortion sentence, Joey was flat broke, and his crew wasn't faring any better. He wanted desperately to be a boss. In fact, he wanted to be the boss. And in witnessing his contemporary and former adversary, Joe Colombo, rise to the position of representante of the entire family was more than Gallo could take. He immediately sent out feelers about the way things stood, but Joe Colombo beat him to the punch. Upon hearing that Gallo had hit the streets, Colombo sent several emissaries with an envelope containing $1,000 cash, along with his best wishes for Gallo now that he was home. Although $1,000 was probably valued at 15 times what it is in today's economy, perhaps $15,000 now, Gallo considered it a slap in the face and immediately demanded to be elevated to a captain status and given a solid slice of all Colombo family racket operations. Joey the Blonde or no Joey the Blonde, or maybe a better handle would have been the Crazy Joe Gallo moniker he'd earned years before, but you do not demand or talk to a family boss in that manner if you want to stay upright and among the living and breathing. Luckily, Joe Colombo half ignored and dismissed Gallo as being the same old Joey he'd known from years before. Colombo had tried to placate Gallo and chose to just put him on the back burner, but he kept a watchful eye out for him nonetheless. Before long, Gallo started his bullshit again, shaking guys down who were on record with other wise guys, pushing in on various businesses and rackets that he had no business putting his nose into, and just generally making a nuisance of himself with his gang. By this time, Colombo's multi-million dollar Italian-American Civil Rights League was in full swing. It had grown to epic proportions within the short time it had been in existence. Gallo ordered his minions to threaten, intimidate, and encourage various neighborhood shopkeepers throughout the city to take down the league's promotional placards, window stickers, and to not contribute money donations to the league, but to pay Gallo their tribute instead. This would be one of the key catalysts to seed disharmony within the ranks. And of course, after Joe Colombo's attempted assassination at Columbo Circle that fateful June afternoon in 1971, which would leave Joe a virtual vegetable for the rest of his life, the gloves finally came off. From that moment forward, there would be a type of guerrilla mob warfare, the likes of which had not been seen in years. Bodies would be strewn on the streets for several years to come, culminating with the infamous 1972 gangland-style killing of Crazy Joe Gallo himself at Umberto's Clam House in the wee hours of the morning. Gallo, his brand new wife and her teenage daughter from a previous marriage, along with Gallo's bodyguard that evening, Pete the Greek Diapolis and his girlfriend, after a night of partying at the famed Copacabana Club in Midtown Manhattan, decided on a late night meal. Driving right into the lion's den in typical Joey Gallo bravado fashion, they chose to eat down off Mulberry Street in Little Italy, arguably the single most dangerous place in the city for Gallo to show his face. Every single block was chock full of mob social clubs, mafiosi hanging out on every corner, and ground zero for New York's five families. He was a marked man, and he knew it. He should have known better. Word soon spread of his arrival to the neighborhood. A Colombo associate immediately ran to a Colombo-controlled social club on Mulberry Street to report the news, and a frantic call was made to Joseph Joyak Yacovelli, who was at the time the acting consigliere for that crew. Yak gave the okay, green-lighting what would happen next. Carmine Sonny Pinto DiBiase, Philip Fat Fungi Gambino, and two brothers known as Cisco and Benny, the Los Ciceros of Brooklyn, immediately grabbed several handguns and automobiles, a work car and a crash car, and off they went. Within minutes, the two wheelmen pulled to the curb, and while waiting with their motors running, the two torpedoes, Sonny Pinto and Fungi, 
came in pistols blazing. It was over within a minute. Tables turned over, food, glass, and plates strewn across the floor, blood all over the place, thick gun smoke and the smell of gunpowder permeating the air, women screaming, and Joey staggering out through the clam house doors full of holes, stumbling into Mulberry Street where he had collapsed at the curb. The gunmen had escaped within seconds. There were no witnesses. Nobody in that neighborhood had seen a thing. Through over 100 years of history in Little Italy, there never had been any witnesses. The neighborhood was famous or infamous for being D&D, &D, also known as deaf and dumb when it came to taking care of its own. Omerta at its finest. Even the legitimate people who lived in the neighborhood would never speak to cops or reporters about guys from there. After all, they might have been gangsters, but they were our gangsters. Fathers, uncles, brothers, cousins, and close friends. The area always policed itself. Always. Over the next five years or so, there would be at least a dozen additional gangland shootings and murders of Colombo or Gallo Hoods, at least some of which were direct fallout from the war. A few other killings seemed to have been a jockeying for positions of power within the unsettled Borgata, and others were of suspected police informants. The following murders were considered a direct fallout of the war, a house cleaning of Gallo dissidents, so to speak. In 1972, four innocent Jewish businessmen eating in a midtown restaurant were shot and killed in a horrible case of mistaken identity. A Gallo gunman mistook them for Alley Boy Persico and Associates. Also that year, Gennaro Fadgeri Ciprio was shot dead while leaving his Italian delicatessen in Brooklyn, and within a year, Louis the Syrian Hubella would also be shot and wounded. In 1974, Gennaro Jerry Bassiano and Sammy Zalrabam were both shot and wounded but survived. In other incidents, Joey Gallo's nephew Stevie Cirillo was shot dead in a gambling den and Gallo stalwart Frank Ponciliano was shot and wounded in another incident. In 1976, they finally caught up to Gallo soldier John Mooney Cutrone. He was shot to death on a Brooklyn street one afternoon. Many of these following additional killings that were committed over the years had their genesis in the various power plays, lingering jealousies, house cleaning, and other private matters that played out before the Brigada finally stabilized. In 1969, top soldiers, torpedoes, and partners, Salvatore Sally D. D'Ambrosio, and Ferdinand Freddy Red de Lucia disappeared off the face of the earth forever. It was said Joe Colombo feared their ambitions and designs on the family, ordering their executions just to be safe in order to prevent another civil war. January 10, 1974. Powerful and feared capo, Dominic Mimi Cialo disappears. Police find his decomposed body and that of a second hoodlum Ten months later, under floorboards, encased in concrete at a mob social club on President Street in Brooklyn. Both had been shot in the head. One of the reasons for his murder is the fear he would try and seize the family. June 22, 1974. Within weeks of Shialo's death, several of his loyal minions are slaughtered after they make it known they want to avenge Mimi's killing. Soldier Gaetano Tommy Barbusca an associate, John Coro, are accosted and shotgunned to death as they sat in a car parked at the curb in the Bensonhurst section. May 10, 1977. Underboss Anthony Abby Schatz Abademarco and his allies Salvatore Sally Boy Albanese and Joseph Joyak Yacavelli make a power play for the top seats against the Persico regime. Albanese disappeared forever after attending a supposed peace powwow. Abadi Marco and Iacovelli went into hiding and are shelved forever. 1983. The Regina brothers, Anthony Fatoni Regina and Vincent Chico Regina, are found shot to death in a burning car on West 15th Street in the Coney Island section. Recently paroled after having served a life sentence for murder, from the old Gallo-Profaci War, 
Fat Tony demanded his reward for being a loyal soldier and stand-up guy, keeping his mouth shut all those years in prison. And this was his reward. Many of the following killings, such as Donnie Summa and Champagne Larry Carosa, were committed as part of the remnants of the war, and as a jockeying for position and power that various Colombo mobsters sought as the years went by. Many of these killings happened because of an unstable leadership on top. There were many various causes, but many were incorrectly attributed to the war per se, when many of them were killed for other reasons. Some of these additional killings included Richard Diddy Lo Cicero, Salvatore Sammy Curatola, Dominic Famolari, Dominic Big Dom DeAngelis, Richard Grossman, Emmanuel Nello Camarada, John Johnny Tarzan Lesterino, Anthony Tony Long Ricciardo, Carlo Giro the Sige Lo Cicero, Edward the Killer Fanelli, Joseph Canazzaro, Arthur the Animal Introtter, John Johnny Irish Matera, Carmelo Mutola, Charles Ruby Stein, Joseph Pereno Jr., Louis Pereno, Angelo Gilly Greca, Thomas Shorty Spiro, Dominic Donnie Summa, Cesar Vitali, Ralph Whitey Tropiano, Lawrence Champagne Larry Carosa, Joseph Joe Brewster Di Domenico, Robert Di Leonardo, Vito Guzzo Sr., Salvatore Scarpa, and Michael Midge Belvedere. Thomas Matteo and Joseph Pereno Sr., though not killed, were both shot and crippled, and Anthony Tony the Gawk Augello and Salvatore Badalamente both committed suicide. By the late 1980s, the Colombo family had reconstituted itself very well. The mid-1970s throughout the entire decade of the 1980s had been heady at times for all Cosa Nostra. The five brigadas had all stabilized, but certainly the Colombo mob had solidified and expanded itself tremendously, to the point that although its official hierarchy, the boss, underboss, and consigliere, had fallen with the 1985 commission case, as had the other four crews, business carried on as usual through a stable acting hierarchy drawn from the ranks of its most capable, Capo di Decina, and soldiers. All was good. Members and associates alike were earning well. Lucrative rackets were being developed and expanded daily, and with few exceptions, there had been relative peace and harmony within. All was good. Acting boss Victor Little Vic Arena Sr., tapped by Persico himself to lead, seemed to be well-liked by the troops. His second, underboss Benedetto Benny Alloy, and consigliere Jimmy Angelino, rounded out an acting administration second to none. But as will happen when you're dealing with mountainous piles of cold cash, handled by greedy and dangerous men, the seeds of disharmony and Machiavellian machinations are never far behind. The Third Columba War would have its genesis in the basic greed inherent in most human beings, men who should have known better had they bothered to stop and study the Brigada's previous mob history. Certainly, Aloy had been groomed by his father Buster and knew their history, as had Arena, a distant Persico cousin who had come up under the old-timers as well. The Colombo mob never seemed to have learned that key underworld lesson that blood begets blood, and that killing solves nothing, that it is very bad for business. The millions of dollars to be made annually and the assets to be gleaned would blind both acting boss Victor Arena and sitting boss Carmine Persico, and the vast power that was at stake was not something that either mafioso was willing to give up. The result was that blood would fill the streets of New York, reminiscent of the 1930s. The havoc it would cause reverberates within the Brigada to this very day. The conflict led to one of the bloodiest gangland wars and struggles for underworld power that America had ever seen. There is an ancient phrase, a proverb if you will, that states, those who choose to ignore history are doomed to repeat it. No truer words have ever been spoken, especially when it comes to the underworld. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Mob Fireside Chat 
presented by Button Guys of the New York Mafia. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next installment. You can also visit us at thenewyorkmafia.com where you can read many more true tales of the underworld and join us for conversation on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until next time.